Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to be here, to remember your sacrifice, to worship you, Lord, for all that you've done for us to do it together as a family. We're privileged to be here on such a great day. We have such a warm and delightful place to go to have fellowship with your people and with you. We thank you, Lord, for drawing us all here together as a family. And I pray, Lord, as we seek your face this morning, as we look into your word, that you would sort through our hearts, that you might encourage us and help us to be more like you in every respect. So, Lord, we give you this time. We give you ourselves. We pray that you guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're, to, we're in Hebrews chapter 10 again today, and we have one of the more difficult passages, uh, one of those scary passages that when you first read it in chapter 10, and I'll just read it for you. For if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. So we'll talk about that. Uh, very interesting verse. Uh, how many of you are afraid of that verse? Good. You should be afraid. The rest of you should be afraid. Be afraid. Be deadly afraid. Yeah. So we'll we'll get to that. Uh, just to let you know where we are. And last week we were obviously in chapter nine, but in the previous weeks we've seen the theme of the book of Hebrews is Jesus is greater. Jesus is greater than everything that a, a person who is a Hebrew is coming from, and he is the fruition, he is the actual thing in which all of the Old Testament points to is the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, of which we're looking forward to here in December. But Jesus is greater than all of these things, and the author goes through great pains to go through all of that, including, including Melchizedek and the priesthood and all sorts of wonderful things that we've uncovered. And as we go, I just want to let you know that there's one of the seven warnings that are here in Hebrews that we're going to find here in chapter 10, which is a warning about despising, uh, which is to turn your back on the things of God, to turn your back on Christ himself. And it's a good reminder for us as Christians. Of course, last time we were in chapter 9, which talks about Jesus in his superior service as a high priest, that he's our high priest and also a king. And so we've gotten into that, but now we're going to get into chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of the good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually, year by year, make those who approach perfect. For then, would they have ceased to be offered? For the, for the worshipers, once purified, would have had no more consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. It's an interesting comparison between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus sealing the New Testament by his own blood and God instituting the sacrificial system in the Old Testament basically to point us to God's ultimate gift, which is the Lamb of God, who is Jesus who came. And he's referring, the author's referring to everything in the Old Testament as a shadow. It's, it, you'll, you'll get a good picture, you'll get a good outline, but the shadow is of Christ. And of course, we looked at the temple and how all of those things point to Christ, his arrival, his ministry, and his resurrection. So uh, I won't go over that again. And how Jesus is a better high priest, he's a better king, he's a better sacrifice, He's a better intermediary. He's better at everything. And he is the fruition of everything the Old Testament was there to point us to. And it's interesting. It says that there were never with these sacrifices, year by year, can ever make the people who come perfect. And yet, when Jesus died for you and said it is finished, he erased all of your sins. And so you are perfectly clean as far as God is concerned. There's a difference between being declared that and actually working that out practically. It's, it's kind of like my son. I'll always love my son. But if he does stupid things, I don't know what I'll do. But I'll still love him. And that's what happens when we enter into the family of Christ. We're forgiven of our sins and we're saved, but we're always being sanctified and cleansed and being saved. So ultimately one day we will be saved. Make sense? And 
imagine you would have to come, imagine doing this on a regular basis to come and give a sacrifice every year for your sins in general. Obviously, you would have to bring sacrifices for sins specifically. Uh, I don't know about you, but I would have worn out my shoes a long time ago having to come to a place and make sacrifice for my sins, whether it be anger, which Jesus equates to murder, or whether it be desiring something or someone other than that which God has given to me, and then suddenly I have to make a sacrifice because it's essentially as though you have raped someone. And Jesus brings all of that to the forefront, and my goodness, uh, you know, I see somebody in a new car, and I go, wow, I'd really like to have a... Oh, i got to go make another sacrifice. But see, Jesus came once and died for all of my sins. And not only that, he also repairs from the inside out. I'm glad for that. But if you had to come every day, every year, no remission of sin, no elimination of sin, just a reminder of sin. My goodness, how many of you like to be reminded of your past sins? Any of you? You, you enjoy that? You enjoy being especially somebody you love and somebody that's close to you. Well, at least I'm not like my mother like you are. At least I don't do this thing like you do. I'm sure none of you people ever think of these things, and I probably shouldn't give you this idea. Um, but there are people that go fishing in the sea of forgetfulness, and they'll pull up all sorts of stuff. Uh, you're going to be spending time with relatives. Maybe you did during Thanksgiving. They tend to be uh, people who will bring up stuff. Remember that horrible, terrible, stupid thing that you did years ago? I, I was starting to forget it, but thank you for bringing up that very painful reminder. And yet, every time you go and you make one of these sacrifices, there's, there's some innocent creature that dies under your hand. And you have to bring it. It has to be perfect in every respect. All of that because it's pointing to Jesus. And all the time having to do that, my goodness, what a reminder of your sin. Nobody likes to be reminded of their sin. We have it so good because of Jesus. Our sins get thrown in the sea of forgetfulness. He separates them as far as the east is from the west. He remembers them no more. That's the deal I want. How about you? Well, we have to be careful. We don't go back to trying to pay for our own sins. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 25 and 24, uh, 24 and 25, Jesus, you remember taking the cup, the Last Supper. Interesting, I included that this week. It says that when he had given thanks, he broke it, meaning the bread, and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup of the supper, saying, this cup of the new covenant in my blood, this do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Well, isn't that the same thing as going and doing a sacrifice? and remembering your sins. There's a difference between remembering your sins and remembering, remembering your Savior. I don't have to remember all my sins, because they're many. I've done business with God straightforward and repented of them, and they're done. I'm not going to carry them around like a backpack full of bowling balls, and neither should you, because Jesus came and died. And if you don't give those things to him and you carry them on yourself, it's completely unnecessary. It's a tactic of the devil, actually, and it will keep you from being fruitful. So what we do when we practice communion is we remember Jesus. We remember him as a memorial. We don't remember how, what horrible, terrible, wicked, nasty, undeserving human beings we are. And certainly that's in part, but it's way overshadowed by the Savior. And so Jesus says, every time you do this, remember what a miserable, horrible person you are. No, he didn't say that. He said, whenever you do this, do it in remembrance of me. And so we make Jesus the center of that and not our failures. Because it's our sin is not being memorialized. It's our Savior when we take communion. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. God set up this thing in which there was a covering for a period of time. It's kind of like you're on probation sort of thing. And if you're obedient and you do that, which God has prescribed in the law, then God covers that. And it's interesting when Jesus came and paid for sins, he paid for those in the past as well, because you can't leave them just under a cover. Uh, you know what happens when you leave something under a cover, at least all winter, it doesn't return the same way in spring. So 
This is, this is a, a cover, which is how the Old Testament was explained. But taking away sins is a very different thing. Jesus came and took away our sins. And, and I have a small little video to show you exactly the difference between covering and disappearing and being removed. You know how they did that? I'm not even going to tell you. Anyway, you know how Jesus did it? He took, his sin, he took our sins upon himself, that he who knew no sin became sin for us, that we might be the righteousness of Christ. Verse 5, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. And then I said, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. Yeah. It's interesting. It says, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, it's interesting because he's pointing all the way back to something David wrote. It's not something that we actually have Jesus verbally saying, but the author says, this is like Jesus saying when he came, something that was prophesied in Psalm 40 by David which I, I think is interesting. A body you have prepared for me. I wonder if this is a conversation that happened in heaven before Jesus came to earth. And Jesus, a body was prepared for him. Interesting. And we're going three weeks is Christmas. Yeah, I'm sorry I reminded you. Anyway, it's about celebrating the Lord's birthday, right? So we should be happy about that. If you're worried about all that other stuff that goes with it, just eject it. You don't need it. A body you prepared for me. In Psalm 51 it says, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would give it. You do not delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. And Jesus came in the lowest possible way. He could have come as God in the sky as he will one day and announced himself and caused everybody to follow him by force or by evidence. And yet God comes into the poorest of families in where you end up having a single mom. I mean, you want to talk about some stigma back in the day. Jesus came in the most humble <coughs> of ways. And he was laid in a manger, which is a feeding trough for animals. You would never think of laying your child in a dog bowl. Yet that's how Jesus came. The lowest of the low, that's how God came and presented to us through his son. Is there anything more lowly, more contrite, more dependent and needy than a human child? You know, you, you, if you watch horses being born or you watch animals in the wild being born, those things get up and walk around and, you know, they, they get going because... You know, the, the laws of nature are such that they might get eaten if they don't. But a human child, they don't walk for a long time. They can't even feed themselves for a long time. They can't do anything. They're completely and utterly dependent. I'm sorry if this adds pressure, those of you having children. But they are utterly, and that's part of the weight that you carry. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm responsible for another life. I get it. And there's so much to know and so much to read. And then you just carry it around and you have to trust in the grace of God, no matter what. But Jesus came in the most humble of fashions, <laughs> completely dependent as a human child. In Psalm 34, it says, the Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and as such have a contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Isn't it interesting? This is a prophecy about Jesus on the cross. If you remember, it was the Sabbath coming up and they said, listen, we got to get this done with and these guys have to die quick. So they go around and they go to break the legs. So they break the legs of one of the thieves and then they go to Jesus and he's already gone. And not one of his bones is broken. It's an interesting prophecy about the Christ who would come. Something else about the sacrificed lamb that you would find on Passover is you were not to break the bones. And it's in the law. You're not to break the bones of this sacrifice. It's rather interesting. We get to see why the Lord puts all of what I would say on a first read, a ridiculous thing in the scriptures. 
got to do this sacrifice like this and none of the bones are broken? I mean, do you understand the struggle of trying to get an animal to submit to you and die? You, you, might, you might break something, you know? Just trying to get a dog in a car is hard enough. Uh, imagine trying to take a lamb and tie it up for a sacrifice. But none of the bones were to be broken on purpose because the prophecies like this are given and they're very specific and, guard, and God guards them. If you remember in Genesis 22, and Abraham called the name of the place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. It was Mount Moriah. You guys know it as Mount Calvary. And it was said on the mountain, the Lord will provide. And he did so much later when he sent Jesus, the son of God, on that very hill that he said, the Lord will provide. And it says, in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. Uh, that's, a, that's an actual page from the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, if you're familiar with the finding of all of that. <clears throat> in the volume of the book, it is written of me. Uh, sometimes I get to do neat things like look into the original language and all. You know what the volume of the book means? <clears throat> it's interesting because you're talking about something that was written far before the New Testament was written. And Jesus, the speaker here, is saying, it is written in the volume of me. It, it's written in the, in the scroll, essentially. Um, the volume of the book, it actually means the little head, which is weird. And the reason they say that is because they would put the title of whatever the scroll was on that little knob on the end of the scroll. And so that's the volume of the book. It's actually, uh, we would call it the binding on a book. But... It's real interesting. Jesus says that in the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will. And so Jesus knew exactly why he was here and what he was doing. It wasn't a masterful accident. In John 12, 27 and following, it says, now my soul is troubled. These are the words of Jesus. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came for this hour. Father, glorify your name. You see, he he equated his sacrifice and death with worship Amen. and glorifying the name of God. Then a voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Therefore, the people who stood by heard it and they said that it had thunders, thundered. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. And Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me, but for your sake. Now, is the judgment of the world now, the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. Jesus said, if I am lifted up from the earth, much like Moses had to lift up a serpent for the people of Israel, if I'm lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. And Jesus was prophesying about his death. He shows some of his humanity here. He shows some of it later in the garden when he says, what am I going to say? I'm, I'm troubled. Uh, I'm going to run away from this. No, I, I'm here for this very reason. That's the whole goal of my life is to die. How about you? Do you know why you're here? Why you're taking up valuable resources, breathing the air and adding warmness to our earth? Why are you here? Jesus knew exactly who he was and exactly what he was doing. Don't you desire that? I desire to know that exactly from God. God, what do you want me to do? What would you have me do? What is my purpose here? Understanding that will make all the difference in how you live. You won't just live accidentally or sloppily or lazily, if those are real words. When Jesus came, he was born in the flesh. He took on human flesh and was tempted in every way as we are and yet without sin. He demonstrated his power by many different ways, none of them to serve himself, but always to serve others. Jesus taught with all wisdom. And in fact, even the ungodly people study the scriptures and they find the truth as they read through the teachings of Jesus. And ultimately he died for us. And so that's the truth of what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. It's about Jesus coming as God's gift to us to ultimately die and be a sacrifice for our sin. Verse 8, previously saying, sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. 
He takes away the first, meaning the old covenant, that he may establish the second, which we understand as the new covenant or the new testament. By that will we have been sanctified through the offering of his body of Jesus Christ once for all. Amen. We see Jesus in his incredible struggle in the garden with his human nature, but not sinful nature, and his divine nature, which is, Father, if this cup can pass for me, but not my will, but your will be done. And Jesus did all of that for us. Does he not deserve all of us? Of course he does. In Luke 22, he says, and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. This is when Jesus was praying in the garden. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So God was not pleased with all of these Old Testament sacrifices. They were a covering until Jesus came and ultimately paid the price. It's like a promissory note uh, or a check. You know, a check that's never cashed doesn't mean much, does it? It's, it's not even worth the paper it's written on. But because it stands for something and there's finances behind it, much like the dollar used to be, um, you know, that it was backed up with gold. It, other than that, it's just a piece of paper. Um, if you ever find a Confederate dollar, it's not worth much because there's nothing backing it. Anyway. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God for that time, waiting until his enemies are made his footstool. That's another Old Testament passage referred to. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So, Jesus worked really hard when he was here, but now he's done, and it, that's the whole thing of him sitting down. You don't sit down until you're done. I don't know about you, but I used to really look forward to getting home and sitting down, having a job where I was up on my feet all day, and I could feel my, I could feel my feet throbbing, you know, and, and my legs relaxing, and just like, oh, a nap would be good about now. <laughs> When the work's done and you sit down, that's a true symbol that you're done. But if you think about it, in the temple, there's no chairs. There's nowhere to sit. There's not a bench. Because when you're in there, it's all business. It's all sacrifice. Because you'll never stop working to be good enough. And yet Jesus came so that we're made good enough. And so why would you bother trying? Jesus sits down. He sits and he doesn't pace. You know, Jesus isn't up there like, oh no, look at all the world and what's happening. <sighs> I wonder how it's going to work out. He doesn't do that. And he doesn't pace back and forth. You, you can see the angel saying, you know, Jesus, I understand you're compassionate, but this is going a little far. He's not worried. He already wrote the end and he let us know what it is. It's all the way into the book of Revelation. He already knows the end from the beginning. And he knows your end from your beginning. So why are you worried? Just let it go. Trust him. And with just one offering, he was done because he gave everything. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Because it is the sacrifice of God's only son, which is given as a gift, whereby we have fellowship with the Father, without which we don't have that. And anybody who tells you otherwise is trying to sell you something. You need to buy this thing online. It's 19.99. Get seven of them. Give them to six of your friends. <laughs> or this centipede will come out and eat your brain. You know, like <laughs> you get things online where people are trying to sell you so that you might be closer to God. It doesn't make you any closer to God. You're already as close as you could be. If you've received the free gift of Jesus Christ, you're there. He can't love you any more than he did by sending his own son. Amen. And you can't add to it. We are saved. Notice this verse 14. For by one offering, which is of Christ, that he, was per that he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. If you've been perfected, why do you have to be sanctified? If you're perfected, why do you have to be sanctified? 
Because perfected is in the eyes of God. If you say, hey, God, you remember the thing I did yesterday? He'll go, no. <laughs> because he sees us holy. And yet, practically, there are lots of things that we got to clean up, right? That's why Jesus washed the feet of the disciples and didn't give Peter a bathroom head to toe. Because he said, you're clean by the word I've spoken to you. You just need your feet washed. And so there's a sense in which we are saved. There is a time in which we give our lives to Christ. We recognize who he is. We accept his sacrifice on the cross. We see him as the son of God, the only provision for our sin. And we give him our lives and say, Lord, you can have, you have at it. I'm yours. And there's a great exchange that happens when we do that and put our faith in the finished work of Christ. I'm saved because there was a day in which I did that. I'm being saved every day because the Lord's polishing me up and getting me to unlearn things that took me years to learn through, you know, bad parenting and uh, watching TV constantly. There are things that God is cleansing out of my life and out of your life. Amen. Amen. And so there's a sense in which we're being saved or in the process of being saved. And there's a day in which you'll come back and ultimately we will be saved. And so understand when you use that term, there's, there's the, the past, the present, and the future participle of it, just as it is here. For through one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So what Jesus did is a once and done, and what he continues to do is the sanctification process. Verse 15, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds. I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. So what he says is, there was a day when God said, there's going to be a different covenant, and the covenant is going to be marked by this. I'm not going to write my laws on stone tablets. I'm going to write them on people's hearts. Amen. And he's talking about the New Testament age. God, through his Holy Spirit, tells us what's going on from the inside out. That's a different dispensation than the old covenant. Everything on the outside, boy, it's, it's easy to forget about that, but when the Holy Spirit's a constant reminder... I don't know about you, but there's no way to get away from that. And it says that there will be a day when it comes, and that's in Jeremiah 31, where it's no longer going to be laws written on stone, but laws that are written in our heart. And that's the new covenant with the Holy Spirit who tells us everything about what the Lord wants us to know from the inside. That's the new and living covenant. And it was all purchased by Jesus, by his death and by his coming. So freedom and forgiveness translates into it is finished. Thou is thy, the debt is paid in full. And that's why Jesus is the most important figure in all of human history. Because he was God's son, God the son, who came and died for our sins. And that's what Christmas is all about, right? So there is no longer an offering for sin. There is no longer a temple there is no longer sacrifices. There are no longer high priests. There are no longer sacrifices that are happening. There is no longer an offering for sin because Jesus did it in a once and done fashion. Amen? So there's no longer a sacrifice for sin left. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest of, by the blood of Jesus, he's talking about the temple, not just the priests, but us, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh. He's speaking about that heavy curtain between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. And having a high priest over the house of God, which is Jesus himself, not an earthly high priest. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Amen. This is a so what clause. This is like, because of everything that's being taught, what does that mean for us? What does that mean to me and how I'm going to live my life? Well, it says that we approach with boldness. How do you approach a holy God who's perfect in every way with boldness? 
You do that when your sins have been forgiven. Amen. And that's the only way you can. I have a picture in my mind of uh, President John F. Kennedy when he was in the Oval Office. And he has a picture of his son underneath his desk crawling around. And you think, oh my goodness, he's got his son in the Oval Office. Like, shouldn't he be working or something? What's he? But his son was able to go in and go out and nobody would stop him and search him for weapons. And, you know, but he just had full access. And, you know, that's the kind of access we have with the father because we have a relationship with him. And yeah, he's the king of the universe and he's perfect in every way. And yet he's forgiven me of my sins. So I can with boldness go before the throne of God, not because I'm worthy, but because his sacrifice is worthy and I've received it. Amen. Amen. So we have this great boldness where we can go before the Lord. This is a new and living way. It's not something that's always dependent upon me doing and making sacrifices. We have full access without restriction. You remember the high priest was the only one that went into the Holy of Holies, but we can go right to God through Jesus Christ. And you don't need to pray to anybody who's dead. Pray to Jesus who lives. So people who are dead aren't going to hear you. Pray to Jesus who's alive. He's our high priest and he happens to be our God. And so Jesus makes this invitation, if you will, through the book of Hebrews to come and see that we would draw near with full assurance, with a heart of full assurance of faith. So when we come before God, you know, it's like, yeah, God, you know, I want to pray to you, but I know that I messed up this morning. I, I, I did something I shouldn't have done. And I said something to somebody that was rude. And so I'll talk to you tomorrow. You guys ever get that? I, 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 you know, Pastor, would you pray for me? I, I'll, I have to do it tomorrow because I screwed up today. And I have to go weep and beat myself and, you know, read seven hours of the Bible straight. And if I don't do that, then God won't hear me. You know, it's, it's a temptation to get that way. And there are churches that become that, where it's all about what you give, you know, like, how, uh, you know, we're going to give you envelopes. We're going to check on you every week. Hey, did you give, hey, you're a little shy, you're a little light this week. You know, there's all this kind of stuff that we can get into and we're not approved before God for any of that stuff other than what Jesus did. Amen. And so we, with hearts of full assurance and a true heart full of faith, we can approach God knowing that the slate is clean and it always will be because Jesus is continually washing us. And we have full forgiveness. It's not just conditional like, ah, don't you do it again. I'll forgive you this time. But you're on probation. But this is how we relate, don't we? This is sometimes how we relate to one another. And this is sometimes how we relate to God, even though the scripture teaches us otherwise. We've been washed clean. And that's the way that the Lord sees us. So, and he's encouraging us in the end to hold fast to our confession without hope, uh, of our hope. And he's encouraging these Hebrew Christians to not go back, even though you might be tempted to go back to that old way of life, don't do it because the sacrifice is too much. And you miss the true reality of everything God was trying to speak throughout all the ages. In verse 24, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. I like this verse. But you know, I'm preaching to the choir because you're all here today. Maybe it's those people on the internet we need to talk to. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. I don't know about you, but... Uh, I, I like this verse and I need to be reminded because when I come to church, for you, it's one thing. For me, it's a different thing. It's like, I got a job to do. I got to make sure the electronics are all good and, and see the battery good. You know, is it, you know, am I, you know, am I dressed properly? You know, I, I have all these things and there are lots of people around here like getting the communion cups ready and the two brothers that shared communion, which they did a great job. And all of this, there, there's all of this work behind the scenes to make this a point at which you can meet with God in a real significant way. And it's a lot of labor. Like there are kids being taught right now. You know, they're not jumping around on the chairs and screaming and yelling and all the things that kids do. And there are people that have committed themselves to do that, which is a wonderful thing. But all of these things have been done for the benefit of all of us. And it says that we should seek to encourage one another. 
I wonder, when coming to church, did you bring a gift? <laughs> you know, don't just save it up for Christmas. I mean, you can come on a Sunday with a gift, and it can be tangible and physical, or it can be spiritual. Because there are people here that are hurting. Amen. There are people here that need to be loved and encouraged. And God might have you to be that person to do. And it says here, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. So you know why I'm here? I'm here to stir you guys up to love and good works. Amen. Like poking the fire. Going to be poking the fire. Going to be stirring, you know. <sighs> that's why I'm here. I hope that's why you're here. Because this applies not just to me, but to us. Right? So, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the habit of some. I mean, ah, it's raining, I'm not going to church. Do, do you think there's somebody there that doesn't need the gift you bring? Do you think that they'll be okay without your encouragement? Do you think that you're expendable? Not a valuable piece? All of those things are false, by the way. I mean, what if I didn't show up? I'm going to leave right now. No, because I'm going to do what the scripture tells me to do. I got a job to do, and so do you. But what a wonderful contribution that the Lord gifts us with to be able to give to one another. So we should consider one another, not me. It's not like, I hope he's done soon because I'm really hungry. I know that they got those chocolate chip bars out there from yesterday. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. It's not about me. It's about you. And it's not about you for you. It's about everybody else. So let's consider one another to stir up one another for love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. This is the word exhorting, by the way. It's parakaleo. Everybody say parakaleo. Parakaleo. That way I can say that, yes, these people speak in tongues. Parakaleo. It's to call near, to invite, to invoke by importation or hortation. Did you know that was a word? There's hortation. That's a word. Believe it or not. So, encouraging somebody is to come alongside and to literally imbue courage into them. You know there are people that need courage? Courage. If you're going to encourage people, there's a way to do that, right? First of all, you've got to know where they're weak or when they have a need or what it is that they're stressing about. And, or you have to notice that they've got a big backpack of bowling balls on and you go, hey... How can I help you with that? And it's literally coming alongside to encourage. I don't know if you've ever met Jules Johnson, but Jules Johnson has a gift of encouragement. Amen. That's a gifted brother. You know, you should watch and learn from this brother how to encourage because he knows how to do it. And it's a gift, but it means that you've got to open up your mouth and, and face off with people too. Amen. He always comes up to me and says, Dave Durande. <laughs> because you know how people like to hear their own names. And that's just his way. He's always encouraging. And he grabbed me by my big fat neck and say, how you doing, brother? I love that. Whether I need it or not, I enjoy it. It's a good thing. Anyway, that's what we do. We come alongside. Parakaleo, by the way, is the root word for the Holy Spirit who is the paraclete. Parakaleo is, is the thing that's done. The paraclete is the one who does it. And so in so doing, we actually take on and personify some of the mission of the Holy Spirit as well. And so we come alongside and encourage one another or exhort one another. By the way, this is not church. For all of you who are watching, might be a good reason you're out there. This is church. You know what you get here that you don't get there? This. You get all of this. How, how are you going to encourage? How am I going to encourage you? I'm really sorry. It might be because it's raining. It might be because you're so far away. It's not even possible for you to be here. But this is not a substitute for this. It's not. And you guys know that, right? I love when I see people that haven't been here for a while and they go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't been here for a while. I've been keeping up though, I've been watching online. 
And that's comforting. That's great. But you miss something when you're not here, you know, and it's important. And there are reasons why you stay home. There are, you know, there are very good reasons to stay home. You know, profuse vomiting. That, that's a good reason to stay home. Uh, COVID-19, you know, uh, the trots, you know, excessive, have to go to the bathroom. Uh, I just made up a disease. Anyway, so this is not church. This is gathering together, not as some, some are in the habit of not coming. And you know what you miss when you don't come? You miss it. You miss it. Uh, my, my new friends, Pete and Renee, will say amen to that. Because they have been in a church. They're fairly new believers in their journey. And they walked in and they were like, is this real? Do people really love each other like this? Yes. And they were just like, oh, we're done. We're in. And they come all the time. They, I, I wonder if they're going to show up when I'm not even here sometime. The scripture says that we are to consider one another, which takes some thinking. It takes some concentration. It takes a purposeful attitude of who can I, Lord, who would you like me to bless today? What are the, what are the needs around me? Who's, who's, who's not there? You know, somebody might, now listen, there might be people short on cash to be able to pay their bills. That's a big deal. I want to find out about that. How am I going to help them if I don't know? How are you going to help them if you don't know? There are people that don't have anywhere to go on Christmas. You got a house? You got a chair? Can you be an encouragement? I bet you could. You see, it's about being prayerful and thoughtful about, Lord, what would you have me do? Your scripture already says that I should not forsake the gathering of ourselves together as some are in the habit of doing. But all the more as you see the day approach, we should be here because you know what? We're going to need each other a whole lot more the harder it gets. Amen? Amen. And it's going to get harder. That's right. right now we're able to meet and there's nobody rushing in the door with guns and killing us. That's right. So let's enjoy it and let's learn how to consider, how to encourage one another. For if we sin willfully... After we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Wow. We were doing really well. Nice, happy scriptures. And then we run into this one. Well, this is about despising these folks turning away and turning their back on Jesus and going back to this old sacrificial system. And what's said is, if you do that, if you sin willfully, now, let me ask you, have you ever sinned willfully? Yes. Yeah. Have you ever sinned unwillfully? I, I can guarantee you almost everything that you do is willful sin. I'm going to do it my way. And you do it your way and you say, that wasn't a good idea. Lord, I'm sorry. That was wrong. Willful sin. Well, if you read the scripture and you just read it for what it says, if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. Okay, let's take it apart here, guys. Sin willfully. All, all sin's willful pretty much, right? Because yeah. we're not slaves anymore. We're, we're volunteers when we do that. And have you done this since you were saved, since you came to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and were enlightened? Did any of you ever sin willfully? Yes. Okay, so this is talking about you. Okay. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I guess God is just being not, he's done being patient with you. He died for you once for your sins. And if you sin from there on, then it's on you. And you're going to go to hell and burn forever. That's what it seems to say. And that's what a lot of people will tell you it means. And yet it doesn't mean that. And then all you have is this fearful expectation of judgment. That means that you threw away God's grace and now you're lost forever. And now you're going to know it, Right. No, that's not what it means. And fiery indignation means that the anger of God will be in your life from now on if you turn your back on Jesus, right? No, but that's what some people will tell you it means. Now, to sin willfully, what is the context of sinning willfully? It's going back to the temple, going back to the shadows, going back to the pictures and the images, not holding fast to Christ, but going back to those things. 
So that's what it means about sinning willfully. If you turn your back on Jesus, if you decide that you're not going to gather with the people of God and you're going to go back to that, you are willfully sinning. It's not just, well, I, you know, I just chose to go back. No, no, you are willfully sinning by doing such a thing. It's going back to the law. There no longer remains a sacrifice for sins because there's no more sacrificing for sins back at the temple. There is, there remains no sacrifice for sins any longer. So you're going back to an empty shell. I mean, shells are pretty to pick up on the beach, but there's nothing alive. You get that? You can't go back because there's no sacrifice for sins that you can make to repent of being a Christian. A fearful expectation of judgment, you are going to be constantly, constantly, because the Holy Spirit is inside of you, knowing you're doing wrong. Any of you ever turned your back on the Lord and gone back to something that you know you shouldn't be doing? Yes. Any of you? Yes. Okay, no hands. Oh, volunteer, thank you. Good, so it's me and you and John. That's good. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I, I remember going back to the bars, which is where I was from and the drugs and, and criminal behavior and all that, and I was miserable. I said, what happened to the happiness? This used to be my happy place. Yeah. This isn't my happy place anymore. What's going on here? Something changed inside of me, and I could never go back. And so what you're going to end up with is this fearful expectation of judgment. I've turned my back on Jesus. He could come today, and who knows? Maybe he thinks I should stick around for the rest of it. And I don't want to do that. And the fiery indignation, you, you have to know that if you turn your back on God and everything that Jesus has done, that you're in danger of being punished because he loves you. Because... God loves me so much, he sent his only son to die, that by me believing in him, that I would have everlasting life. Amen. And when I made a commitment to him, he made a commitment to me. And I have let him down a million times. And he never will. Amen. He will never leave you or forsake you. And so there were times I wanted to shirk the spirit of God off and say, leave me alone. Let me go back to what I was doing. You can't go back. Amen. You've been changed. Butterfly can't be crawling on the ground anymore. So what it means is there's no sacrifice for sin left back there. And all you have waiting for you back there is this fearful expectation that you are under the judgment of God. That's all you have to look forward to. So there is no sacrifice for sin left because Jesus did it once for all and it's over with. So that's what it means. So when you read it through in the privacy of, you know, your time with the Lord, read it through the lens of the people who it was written to, and you'll understand it. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. That's the, that's the law, right? Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, which is what you do when you turn your back on him, Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, a common thing, which is what we do when we turn our back on Jesus, and insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You guys know what it is to fall into the hands of the living God when you're on the wrong side of being obedient. It's a scary thing to think all he's got to do is just speak a word and your heart stops beating. Yep. And you've got an appointment and you're not going to be able to miss it. God is serious. And in the Old Testament, if you were caught in an infraction, there were two, three witnesses that would gather up. If you were found guilty, they would pick up stones and stone you to death. <laughs> Boom, done. Executed. Judgment done. That was the Old Testament. But see, we have a relationship with the living God. The same holy God that created the Old Testament is in the new, except Jesus took all that for us. That's the only thing. And you know, you can get very lazy and spoiled with that, can't you? And take it for granted. In Hebrews 12, 11, we'll get there one day. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful Nevertheless, afterward, it yields a peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You see, difficult times in our life in a Christian who has a relationship with God through Jesus Christ is not about punishment. It's about training. Anything that you go through 
It's not about punishment. It's about training. There was a time as a Christian when I found it hard to find enough work to pay my bills, and so I, be I began to lose my house. I got behind in my payments, and I almost lost my house. Now, I could say, God must have been punishing me. But I wasn't in any willful sin. So why did that happen to me? And I get people that come to me with these great grand questions, the stump the pastor questions. God is teaching me and training me. He's training me. And he's training you. By whatever it is that you're going through, he's training you. And ultimately, listen, we're all ticking time bombs. We all have expiration dates stamped someplace. We're all going to have to go home somehow. So I'm not going to get too bent up about that. I'm just going to say, Lord, what do you want me to do here? What do you want me to do with this? What are you trying to speak to me? How are you going to... And it says that it will make this wonderful fruit in our lives of righteousness when we're trained by it, which means that we have to respond to it in the right way. We can't say, huh, I'm mad at God. Okay, well, good luck with you. You'll be there for a long time until you ask the Lord, what's going on here? What do you want me to do? What are you trying to show me? And then we learn, right? And if you've ever met a patient person, you know that they've had a difficult life. You're not just born patient, right? Well, I'm Irish. Well, that means you're not born patient. <laughs> yeah, but I'm Italian. Well, that means you're not born patient. You know, I mean, you know, pick a nationality. Uh, well, I'm a redhead. Well, that means you're not born patient either. In fact, none of us are born patient. It's something that is developed inside of us as a fruit as it grows, and it's a fruit of the Spirit. So we submit ourselves to God's hand, and we're trained by it, as opposed to being rebellious and turning our back on him. Verse 32, but recall the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great struggle with sufferings. He's reminding the Hebrew Christians of the, all the sufferings they went through when they first converted. Partly while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. The first century church was under a lot of persecution. And for you had... You had compassion on me in my chains. The author is writing this. That sounds very familiar. There's some other author that we know who was having people have compassion on them while they were in chains. I just want to show you a secret little keyhole into who it might be here. You had compassion on me in my chains and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods. That's got to be hard knowing that you have a better and an enduring position, a possession for yourselves in heaven. So he says, guys, remember when you first came to Christ? When I remember when I first came to Christ, I was so excited about Jesus. I would tell everybody about Jesus, and I didn't know anything. I had zeal without knowledge, boy. I was on fire. I'd say, do you know Jesus? You know about Jesus? You know he was God's son. He came and died for you. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? Praise God. You need to be a Christian. Let's pray right now. People are like, what are you on, man? You better calm down. I was just because I was free. Amen. Remember in the beginning, you know, it's important. We tend to remember the things we should forget and we forget the things we should remember. Remembering when I first came to Christ and I, I know that that burden was lifted from me Amen. and that slavery to sin was, was taken away. I still have a lot of unlearning to do, and I'm not perfected yet. But I, I can tell you there was a, a visceral difference between who I was and who I am. And I hope you have had that impact, that Jesus Christ has come into your life and the Spirit of God lives in you in a real way, because there's nothing like it. Amen? Amen. So remember how difficult it was in the past. Don't make it worth nothing. Don't, don't forget that. And don't forget to, re to remember And we should look up. I don't know about you, but um, most people in this day and age, I, I've become very acquainted with the top of their head. <laughs> don't talk to me. <laughs> to the point where they have to teach in college actually how to do a job interview because they don't understand relational things like that. And so 
you got to look up from your phone every once in a while, don't you? I mean, even if, you, if like me, you're doing devotions and you got, you know, a thousand things coming in that you read on a daily basis, you got to get your face out of that phone because it will take all your energy and all of your effort. And at the end of the day, when you have to charge the thing back up, you'll say, what did I accomplish? It's almost like when TV first came out. We had, a, we had a black and white TV and it was all grainy, but we didn't care. We'd sit there for hours and veg. We should look up because there's something coming and the Lord is coming back soon, people. Amen. Therefore, we do not cast away our confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance. He's telling these folks who want to turn their back on Jesus, you need endurance. And so do we. So that after you have done the will of God, that you may receive the promise. Yet for a little while, and he was coming, will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. But if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him, is the word of God. But we are not of those who draw back to perdition, but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. He says, listen, if you turn your back on the Lord, the Lord's not going to be happy with you. He doesn't say that you're going, to, you're going to go to hell. He says his soul will not be happy with you because our salvation is not conditional upon our perfection. Amen? Amen. So he says, you have need of endurance. Well, how do, how do we get endurance? Well, there, there are ways in which we get endurance. One is through learning, what you guys are doing here today. You're getting information maybe you never considered or you're considering it from another point of view. Inspiration is something that the Holy Spirit brings once we have the information. The Holy Spirit brings the inspiration and we go, oh, you guys know what that's like, right? I hope so. Or I'm really working real hard for nothing. <laughs> inspiration is something the Holy Spirit does. Application is making a plan. What am I going to do about this? How am I going to proceed forward? How does this change the way that I live? And the other one is perspiration, which is actually have to do the work. You got to put it into practice, which means it takes effort and energy and a concentration and a purposeful setting of your mind before God, asking for strength and then moving forward to be obedient to what he's called us to do. So this is how endurance is built. We have the information that comes first. We've got the inspiration that comes. There's the application where we make a plan and then there's the actual perspiration. Um, you'll find that most people get stuck, especially since January 1st is coming, get stuck in one of those you know, some people are really inspired on January, I mean, on December 31st. I'm going to make myself a commitment, go to the gym every day for four hours at four in the morning when no one's there. Okay, that sounds like a bunch of willfulness that's going to fall to the ground like a dead leaf. This is the process. We're given information. It's funny, most people don't make a life change unless there's, uh, especially physically, un until they have some kind of a major medical issue. Oh no, I have diabetes? No, ain't nobody got time for that. I'm, that's it. I'm changing my diet, you know. Anyway, I'm, I'm digressing. I know. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27 says, Do you not know that all those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. By the way, he's not talking about salvation. He's talking about winning a prize. You guys want to win a prize? Yeah. Yay! Most, most people are thrilled about that. <laughs> Everybody runs, but only one's going to win the prize. You should run in such a way as to obtain it. Amen. Well, that sounds competitive. <laughs> Yeah, but you're competing with yourself. So no matter what, you win. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate or, or disciplined in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown like those people that are in the Olympics. But we, for an imperishable crown, you see, it's not salvation, it's a reward, it's a crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty. Thus, I fight not as one who beats the air. I'm not running around in shadow boxing. But I discipline my body and I bring it into subjection. Lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. Not disqualified from salvation, but disqualified from the prize, which is a reward. 
So run in such a way as to win the prize. Ah, ain't nobody got time for that. I don't, don't want to run no race. You guys get that way? You feel that way? You, I, I heard somebody thinking that. <laughs> but see, running this race for the Lord has its own benefits, doesn't it? Because when you do everything that the Lord would have you do, you are in perfect peace. Amen. You don't worry about stuff. The Lord is constantly giving you wisdom to say the thing that you need to say at the time you need to say it. You don't make stupid decisions. You don't, you know, kick your car when it doesn't start and break your foot. You know, like there are all sorts of great benefits to just being with the Lord and spending time with him. So I would encourage you to do so. There are great rewards. If you read through the seven churches in the beginning of the book of Revelation, there are all of these rewards and there are exhortations to the church and there's warnings that if they don't straighten up and fly right, that the church is going to get disbanded. But there are also rewards if they preserve, if they persevere through it. So um, if you can read through that, it's actually interesting to think that these churches are comprised of people who have come to Christ and some of them who are true believers, some of them might be make believers, but the church itself was in jeopardy because they weren't running the race to win. And I don't, I don't want to be one of those people. Like I think about Samson who's listed in the following chapter here in Hebrews. And he says that he did things by faith. And I think, I don't know. doesn't seem like I'm going to see this guy in heaven. I mean, he's, got a lot of problems, you know, and yet I don't want to be like that guy led by my emotions and my desires and wake up one day and just discover, oh my goodness, I'm an old man and I've wasted my life. I have dreams like that, nightmares like that, that I wake up and I'm old and I've, and I've missed my life. So Jesus gives us this superior service we have this knowledge of the truth and there is no longer a sacrifice for sins because it's been made for us on behalf of Christ. So what do we do about that? We go before him with great boldness. We gather together as, as, as some are in the habit of doing and we don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together and we seek to encourage one another daily while it's still called today because you're never guaranteed that tomorrow will ever happen. So... I hope you guys are enjoying the book of Hebrews. It's very instructional. It's inspirational. I'm going to call the worship team up. I want you guys to think about what the Lord might want you to take with you today. It's, a, it's an easy thing to, to walk into a, a theater of this type and listen to conversation and read the scriptures and the Lord speak to your heart. And then as soon as they say amen and you get up and you make a beeline for the food to forget about it. I'd like you to consider what the Lord might want you to take with you and put a handle on it.